You are listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby of Torch in Houston, Texas. This is the Thinking Talmudist Podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to the Thinking Talmudist Podcast. I hope everyone is enjoying lunch. Thank you, Ed, our chef, for a spectacular, delicious, scrumptious, healthy lunch. Right, David? It's healthy? There you go. Delicious, delicious. See, everyone agrees. Everyone agrees. It's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and thank you to our friends who are online on Zoom. It's a particularly special privilege to learn Torah right before Shabbos when it's crunch time and we're getting ready for Shabbos. We're able to you know, get a little bit more Torah into our week. It's such a special thing. So I want to thank you all because it really makes it a great Shabbos for me, I'm telling you. I know you think, because I say this a lot in other classes, it's my favorite class, but this is like my favorite class. I love seeing each and every one of you at the class. It makes it so special. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And of course, to our friends who are on uh, Zoom and those of you who are on uh, the other platforms, what is it, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch. There we go. You know, you remember. Yeah, Twitch. So all the gamers out there can have some respite from uh, the gaming world and uh, Fortnite and all of those. They can come in and join us for a Torah class. All right. So the past couple of weeks, we were, t- we were learning the Talmud that is going through each of the verses in the Torah that deals with the exodus from Egypt. We started uh, the Talmud in Sota 11a. And or or 10b actually, and the Talmud goes into each verse that the Torah tells us. Like, let's see the rest of the story. What's really going on? Why does it specifically use that word? And we'll see se- several examples of that in our Talmud today. So we talked last week. We left off with the sign that Pharaoh gave the midwives to determine whether or not a baby was a baby boy or a baby girl. If the baby was born today, it's not the case anymore in, in in the world of medicine and how things are. Today, babies are born both ways. But it used to be that girls were born face up, boys were born face down. That's what the Talmud says. And this is what Pharaoh told the midwives, the Jewish midwives, delivering the babies. They're like, if it's face down, it's a boy, just throw him straight into the Nile. Just kill him. Get rid of him. Okay. So scripture records the response of the midwives to the order. Pharaoh gave an order. He says, kill the babies, kill the baby boys. And what did the midwives respond? They said, They saw God, they feared God. And they did not do as the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, spoke to them. So it's a very interesting term. Alehem means on them, like he told on them. What does that mean? It should say lahen, to them. Why does it say alehen, on them? Something's not right with that terminology. But what do we know about the Torah? We say this in every single Parsha class. There's not an extra letter in the Torah. So if the Torah says it specifically like this, it's important for us to delve into the reason behind why it says it exactly like that. So the Talmud questions the verse's use of the word alehen, which means on them, it should have been to them. He said to them, lahen mi ba'ale, it should have said lahen, which means to them, not alehen. The Gemara answers, Amar Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Hanina, Rabbi Yossi, the son of Rabbi Hanina said, milamed shetva on lidvar avere, this teaches us that Pharaoh prepositioned them to a sinful matter, to adultery. He tried to seduce them. Velo nitvu. And they did not accept the propositioning. Listen to this. Pharaoh is trying to persuade the two midwives to kill the babies. And in what way will he have the ability to persuade them? In what way will he be able to overcome their lack of desire to kill those babies, let me seduce them. Commentaries say an amazing thing. The term alayim is suggestive of marital relations. As in Genesis, it says, 
he cohabit- cohabitated with her. Why does the verse use such a term? Why? Because Pharaoh hoped to establish this relationship with them so there would be a greater chance of their carrying out his orders. And the Gemara says further that they didn't say lo ratsu, they didn't want to. It says that they didn't. What does that mean? If Tzadok notes that the Gemara does not say velo ratsu and they did not want to sin with him, for that would imply that they considered the possibility, even momentarily, and decided against it. Rather, the Gemara states literally that they were not prop- propositioned. That is, the thought of complying never entered their mind at all, as if the preposition was never had never occurred. So I want to share with you, there's a famous story about Rev. Clonimus, Rev. Klonimus, in part of the, the most powerful part of the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur prayer is a prayer called Nisana Tokef, which is the awesomeness of the day of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And if most, if anyone cries on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah during the prayers, it's at this point where we say, Mi Ba'esh, who's going to die by fire and who's going to die by water and who's going to die by famine and who's going to die by all of these tragic scenarios. And we say, Hashem, please forgive us because we're going to do teshuva. So where does this prayer come from? It comes from the holy Reb Klonimus. Reb Klonimus was a very good friend with one of the um, bishops. And the bishop, you know, their friend, they used to schmooze, talk a lot about uh, theology, and they talk about philosophy, and they talk about... See, he says to him, he says, you're such a great guy. Why don't you just convert to Christianity? So he says, come back to me in three days, let me think about it. And when the bishop left, he started crying, begging God for forgiveness. How can I have ever even given him an a, 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 a inkling of a thought that I would even consider it? That I would even consider it? Three days later, after crying for three days straight, the bishop comes back and says, what's your answer? He says, cut off the tongue that even led you to believe that I might even consider rebelling against my God. So what did he do instead? What he did was he cut off, the bishop cut off Reb Clonimus' legs and, and, and hands. And it was a couple of days before Yom Kippur and Reb Clonimus, suffering and pain, asked them, to bring him to the ark at the beginning of Kol Nidre. And he opens up the ark, couldn't open the ark, someone opened it for him, and he collapsed right there after citing this special prayer, and he died right there. His soul left his body, and he passed away. And just a little bit later, the rabbi of that congregation had a dream, which was like a, prof- a prophetic dream, where Reb Klonimus taught him that prayer. And that prayer is the prayer we have in our Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur prayer. But what I'm, the point that I'm trying to say here is that even the thought that you can think that I would consider such, a, such an idea, such a preposterous, rebellious idea. Here, the midwives didn't even have the, don't not even the thought. No, well, should we, should we not? No, I don't think, no, no, no. Not even a thought. And that's why? Because they had fear of God. When there's something that we know is right, we shouldn't even have a thought, should we or should we not? We make a commitment. And the opposite is true. When it comes to something which you know is wrong, we shouldn't even have a moment's hesitation. We shouldn't even give a thought that we're even considering. If it's something which is wrong, it should be, no, I'm not going to do that. They didn't even consider it. The Gemara infers this from the fact that the verse did not simply say that the midwives did not kill the children. The term that they kept them alive, they kept the babies alive, implies that they helped 
in a more active way. Not that they just, we, we hid them, but rather they raised them. They gave them food. They gave them drink. They gave them everything these babies needed. And the Talmud continues now. It says, the verse concludes, And they kept the boys alive. How? The Gemara elaborates. Tana the Brisa teaches us. Not only did they not kill the babies, but but they supplied them water and food to them as well. They gave them extra resources. They gave them extra care. Why? Because that's what people who are God-fearing do. You don't do something against the will of Hashem. Oh, but it's not popular. Who cares popular? You do what the Almighty wants from you. The Talmud now continues and says, Scripture records the midwife's explanation to Pharaoh as to why they did not kill the babies. Vatomarna, and they said, Tomarna Mialdos, the midwife said, El Paro to Pharaoh, Kilo Kanoshima Mitrios Haivrios, because not like the Egyptian women are the Hebrew women, for they are Chayos, they are living. Before the midwives come to them, they had already given birth which obviously wasn't true. But what they were saying was to try to save these babies. They said, you know, Egyptian midwives, it takes them a while to give birth and they, you know, it's a whole process. So if it was for the Egyptian babies, we could kill them. But over here, we're called to a scene to for a baby, a mother giving birth. And by the time we get there, the baby's born already. What can we do? Baby's born and the baby's already out of our control, and we can't kill that baby. The Gemara asks, "My chayos, what does the term chayos, meaning giving them life, mean in this context?" If you say it should be translated as actual midwives, and the midwives were telling Pharaoh that all the Jewish women were skilled midwives themselves, and thus did not require assistance. This is untenable. Why? Does not even a midwife need another midwife to help her give birth? Right? It's not enough that you be a midwife. You can't deliver your own baby. I mean, you can technically, but it's, it's difficult. But even if you tell me that every Jewish woman is a midwife unto her, unto her own, that doesn't help her deliver her own baby. How could the midwives defend themselves with this argument? The Gemara therefore offers another interpretation. Ella Amrulo Umazu Kechaya Nimshala. Rather, the midwives said, This nation is compared to a wild animal. Yehuda Gurarya, just as Judah is a lion cub. Dun Yehidan Nachash. About Dun it is written, Dun shall be. A serpent. Naftali Ayala Shlucha. Naftali is a it's a hind let loose. Yisacha Khamar Garm. Yisachar is called a strong bone donkey. Yosef Bechor Shar is in reference to Joseph, it says, the firstborn of the ox. Binyamin Zev Yitraf. This is all from the blessings of, of Jacob. Benjamin is called a wolf who devours his prey. Dhsiv Bey Ksiv Bey. Those tribes about whom such a metaphor is written, it is written about them. And even regarding tribes about whom such a metaphor of relation to an animal, of how they're compared to an animal, it is not written. It still applies to them. That is a verse in Ezekiel that says, about the Jewish nation as a whole. Oh, how your mother was a lioness crouching among lions. The midwives therefore claimed, just as beasts do not require midwives, so too the Israelite women, they don't either require midwives. Look, all of the tribes of Israel, they're all compared to animals. And animals, they don't have midwives carrying their, you know, helping them deliver their babies. So, 
Same thing as with the Jewish women. They don't need midwives. So what do you what do you think is going to happen when you send us there? They don't need us. Not that they delivered. So this is a different opinion that it wasn't that they the Jewish women delivered the babies themselves or that they were midwives themselves, but rather that they're just like the animals who don't need a midwife to deliver. So the Gemara now states, what is the reward that the midwives got? The verse states, the midwives' reward was, It was because the midwives feared God that he made houses for them. Hashem made houses for them. And this is a verse in Exodus, right, chapter 1, verse 21. The Gemara debates what this means. Rav or Shmuel? There are two opinions. Rav and Shmuel disagree. Chad Omar One says he made for them houses of kahuna, of priesthood, and levia, of the Levites. And the other, Vechad Omar Bate Malchus. While the other one said he made for them houses of royalty. Manda Omar Bate Kuhuna Levia, the one who says that they got houses of priesthood and the house of the Levite tribe, which is those who are going to serve in the temple and those who are going to furnish the temple and those who are going to carry the temple, those who are going to sing in the temple, who are going to be the servicemen for the temple, which is the tribe of Levi. Aaron and Moshe was referring to Aaron and Moshe, who are the children of Yocheved, who was the midwife. Uman de Amr Batamalchus, and the one who said the houses of royalty, of kingship, David Nami Mimiriam Kaasi, he was referring to King David because he also came from Miriam. King David was a descendant of Miriam, and Miriam was the other midwife. So we see that both of them were true. Indeed, Yocheved got the house of priesthood and the house of the Levites, while Miriam got the house of kingship. Her children, the children of Yocheved were Moshe and Aaron, and the children of Miriam ended up being David, King David and King Solomon. Pretty, pretty great reward, right? To have such a lineage, to have such, such descendants come out of you. Dixiv, as it is written, Vatamas Azuva Ashes Kolev, Vayikach Lo Kolev S. Ephras. When Azuva died, Caleb married Ephras, Vatelid Lois Chur, who bore him Chur. This Ephrat is the reference to Miriam. Dixiv, as it says, Vidavid ben Yishai Ephrasi. It says that David was the son of the Ephratite man. David was the son of a man who traced his lineage back to Ephras, who was Miriam. Amazing. Quite a reward. What's the reward for? The reward, it doesn't say the reward was for saving the babies. The reward was for fearing God. There's something about being a God-fearing individual. Where my relationship is not worried about my neighbors, what are they going to say? What are they going to think? You know, oh, if I do this, they oh, they're going to think I'm just a goody-goody. They're going to think, oh, how many of us have had this? You come to a class and people are like, oh, you're, you're going religious, right? <laughs> right? You, oh, you're becoming orthodox, right? People, people, people right? If someone does something which is the right thing to do, because this is what Hashem wants me to do, the barometer has to be not what people say. The barometer needs to be what God will say. And this is what these midwives teach us. Our matriarchs in Miriam and Yocheved are teaching us what it means to be committed to the cause of following the word of Hashem. Nobody else. I guarantee you it wasn't a popular thing. People were afraid. There were a lot of Jews who did not make it out of Egypt. As we learned yesterday in our partial Review class. You can listen to it on the partial Review podcast. 
on all platforms. But we see that during the plague of darkness, the Jews who were not of the most righteous leaning, those who were rebelling against Moshe and Aaron, those who didn't want to leave Egypt because they're like, ah, it's so good here. Look how much they're taking care of us. Yes, it's a little hard work. It's a big deal. They were comfortable with being in exile. Those didn't make it out. They were more worried about their Egyptian neighbors than they were about the creator of heaven and earth. This is what the midwives, and that's why there's such a focus about them in the Torah, because they teach us a very, very important lesson. There's only one consideration we should make when we do an action, and that is, is this something Hashem will be happy with? That's the only barometer we need to have, the only metric we need to care for. Is this something God will be pleased with? And you can think about that. When it comes to paying your taxes, should I disclose that? Should I not disclose that? Yeah, the government doesn't need my money. What what would God want me to do? God. The problem is, is that I had an individual, dear friend of mine, he calls me up and he says to me, Rabbi, I'm here at the Palm. Familiar with that restaurant? It's not kosher. They don't sell any hummus, okay? So... Not that all hummus is kosher, but I'm just so you know, it's not a kosher facility. And he says to me, I'm eating, I don't want to even go into what he was saying he was eating, all this nonsense. And he says, I love it so much, I want to thank God. Can I say a blessing? I said, do you think that that's what God wants from you? He literally, I said, your child steals your car, should he call you to say thank you? It's clearly not what you want. Why would you say that would be an insult? For a person to recite a blessing, thanking God for something God tells us clearly not to do. Jay agrees. And if Jay agrees, we're in a good place. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very big challenge. It's a very big challenge for us to realize that we're not, we're not free people. In fact, something I left out from yesterday's class, I wanted to talk about it, but I, I, it slipped my mind. It says, You know someone who's really a free person, a vacationer? Someone who studies Torah. That's what it says. The Talmud says that if you want to know someone who's a real free person, it's someone who learns Torah. Why? What could be better than talking with God, speaking His words? What could be better than spending your time on planet Earth learning God's word? This is what God wrote. This is what God gave us. This is his document. There's nothing more freeing than someone who is learning Torah. Even David doesn't pick up his phone when he's learning Torah because he's so free. Yeah, David, David. I have to pick on you at least once a class. Even if you sit far, it doesn't help. Sometimes even if you're not even here, I do it. You're the teacher's pet. You're the teacher's pet. Okay, so the Gemara now discusses other allusions to Caleb, Kalev, and Miriam in Chronicles. Vekalev ben Chetzron holid es azuva isha. Caleb, son of Chetzron, Sired Azuva wife, the S Urios and Urios, the Elebonel, Yeshar, Veshovav, the Ardon. And these are her sons, Yesher, Shovav, and Ardon. The Gemara asks Ben Chetzron, why does Chronicle refer to Caleb as the son of Chetzron? It says Ben Yefunehu, because he was the son of Yefuna. The Torah states. Caleb, the son of Yefuna, was one of the twelve Miragam, one of the twelve, one of the twelve spies who went to Israel with Joshua, and that he was from the tribe of Judah. The Gemara asks, so the Gemara explains. Ben Shefana Me'atza Samaraglim. Why is he called Yefuna? Yefuna is like, you know, we know we call him Kalev Ben Yefuna. That's what we call him. But why is he given that name? That wasn't his father's name. 
See, he says his father's name was really Chetzron, but Caleb was called the son of Yefune because Caleb was a son who turned aside. He was Pana from the plot of the spies because he went against the advice of the spies. He went against what they wanted to do, which was to talk negative about the land, the holy land of Israel. And he turned aside and did the right thing. Again, think of the think of the parallel here to what the midwives did, to what Kalev did. He, they didn't do what was popular. Their barometer was, what does Hashem want from me? That's the only metric that counts. What does Hashem want? And Kalev thought about that. He didn't want popularity. He didn't want everyone to be like, oh, thank you for giving us that that courageous report. You went and it's such a terrible land and it's, you know, they're giants in our eyes. He went against the grain. By the way, very interesting halacha. The halacha says, you, we, we see this in, again, Parsha podcast alert, okay, Parsha review podcast. We mentioned that the Israelites, before they left Egypt, they had to take the idol of the Egyptians, which was the lamb, tie it around on the foot of their bed, and they'd have to keep it there for four days. For what purpose? To see whether or not the animal had any blemishes. Why? Because you can't serve an offering with blemishes. So if it has uh, missing one eye, it has a broken leg, it has a rupture in its lungs, that renders the animal unkosher. And it's true. If you can sell it to Tyson, you can sell it to Purdue, it doesn't go to Meal Mart to Glot Kosher. It doesn't go like that, okay? When you buy kosher food, you should just know you're buying the healthiest animal available. And I'll tell you, I was in a in a, a farm in Israel that had many cows. We asked the farmer, I was there with my rabbi, and we asked the farmer, how many of your cows end up being kosher? So he said of the recent sale that they made of animals, they sold 18 cows. Six were glot, means perfect, pristine quality. Eight were kosher, but not in the greatest condition. And four were not, not kosher at all. So that's right. And they go to the non-kosher. So they, they sell it to non-kosher, uh, you know, Distributors, meat houses. So we asked him, how do you ensure that you have more kosher animals? And listen to the beautiful answer he gave. He said, we see that when we raise a cow from being a little calf and it's never hungry and it's never thirsty, even when it goes out into the wild, it goes into grazing, it always has the water. It's never thirsty. It's near its mother. It ends up being a glot kosher animal. But... When it suffers the trauma of being too thirsty, it doesn't have enough food, it becomes non-kosher. When it has, a, a, you know, and in Israel it gets very hot. It's a desert, most of it. And when it doesn't have enough nutrients, when it doesn't have what it needs, that's when it becomes a non-kosher animal. So think about that. A kosher animal is the, the perfection of the animal. This means that the entire process of that animal's growth, it was fed properly, it was given to hydrate properly, it was given all the nutrients, it was given, it was close to its mother. Think about that for our children. Not only feeding them healthy food, giving them something to drink, it's nurturing them properly. We put down our phone and we spend time with them when we're able to build a beautiful relationship with them. I had students many years ago. They all had, they were all from LA, wealthy families, and they all 16, 17-year-old boys, and all back home, this was in Israel, all back home, this one had a Beamer, and this one had a Mercedes, and this one had, and these are young kids. I'm like, isn't there anybody who thinks that this is crazy? that little kids are driving around these expensive cars? You know what their answer was? And it was it's so painful to hear such an answer from these kids. They said, our parents gave it to us to get out of their hair. 
Just go. T- take the car and just go. I don't want to deal with you. It's a tragic thing. How many kids today do we see when you go up and down the aisles of any supermarket and you see the kids there with their big tablets, instead of looking around, learning facial expressions, seeing people, seeing the world, they're busy looking at a device. It's tragic. The Talmud says a very amazing thing about how to determine something being kosher or not. So, of course, you have to let it sit in the pen for a while. You're able to tell this one is limping. He's got a broken leg. He's not going to be a kosher animal. Wait till it gets healed. Because if at the time of slaughtering it has one of those blemishes, it's not kosher. So how do you check fowl, a duck? How do you check it goes in the water? What you do is you put it down a stream facing upstream. And if it could swim against the current... It's a kosher animal. If it can't, it means it probably has a broken leg or something because it's not strong enough to go against the current. Our sages tell us something remarkable. It's the same with the human being. If you can go against the current, that defines you as a kosher person. If you can only go get flushed down the river Because this is the current, and you're not strong enough to stand up against it, it might be a sign of a flaw, of a deficiency. Such a powerful lesson. You have to be able to stand against the current. You have to be able to fight against what's popular, and instead do what's right. We learn this from the midwives. Do what's right. Stand up for what you believe is the will of Hashem. Of course, we have to invest in knowing what the will of Hashem is. It's not just like, oh, God wants me to just enjoy life, right? So I can go to to the palm, God forbid, heaven forbid. That's not what God wants us to do. Invest more time in learning what the will of Hashem is. It's such an incredible responsibility that we have. We're going to be given choices throughout our lives. Be able to stand firm when we know the right decision is unpopular. And just do it. And don't regret it. And don't feel bad. I don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. Do it. This is the right thing. You do it. You stand up for it. Where is a badge of honor? And this is what we see here, a parallel of Kalev ben Yifune. He had the same thing. He was able to stand up against the other spies and give the correct report, the honest report. The Gemara explains, Ben Shepanamatis Miraglim. He turned away, he turned aside from the plot of the spies. The Gemara asks further, Vakati ben Kenaz, who? But still, Caleb was, was not the son of Chetzron, but rather the son of Kenaz. Why? Because it says, Asniel ben Kenaz, Achi Kalev. We see that it says that Asniel ben Kenaz, Caleb's brother, conquered it. So we see that he's referred to as the ben Kenaz, the son of Kenaz, and that was Caleb, his brother. So it has to be that his father was Kenaz as well. The Gemara explains, Amarava Rava said, Chorgo de Kenaz Havo. Caleb was the stepson of Kenaz. Caleb and Usniel were merely maternal brothers. Because the land was great, and this is the land that Hashem gave us. Oh, oh so that's oh, we're going to get into that. When we talk about that in the book of Numbers, we're going to talk about that. We'll pull out the Talmud that discusses it. What was what were they thinking? What were they thinking? What is going on in their mind that they would even consider talking about the Holy Land like that? It's an excellent question. And Dave, Dave, you always ask the question of our sages. You might want to check. You might be one of those sages. What does Duvit say? What does Duvit say? So here the Gemara continues. Okay, so let's we're gonna we're gonna go a little bit further. We're gonna talk. We're gonna go back to Miriam and uh, dealing with her descendants being King David. So this is now in the middle of page twelve a in Tractate Sota. After a lengthy digression, 
in which the Gemara discusses Miriam's relation to the Davidic dynasty and related matters, the Gemara returns to the topic of Pharaoh's decree against the Jewish people. As noted above, these decrees were successively more severe. The last decree discussed above was Pharaoh's command to the midwives to kill the male children at childbirth. The Gemara teaches, And Pharaoh commanded his entire people, saying, Every son that will be born... Into the river shall you throw him. Amar Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Hanina, Rabbi Yossi, the son of Rabbi Hanina, said, the phrase, his entire people indicates, Af al Amo Gazar, that he implied this decree to his own people as well. It wasn't only to the Jewish baby boys, but he says now the decree is to all baby boys, even Egyptian baby boys. So that way, if you see a little baby boy, you'll know. This little rascal was supposed to be dead, okay? That's, that was Pharaoh's decree. The Gemara summarizes the decree. The son of Rabbi Hanina says, Further, Pharaoh issued three decrees. In the beginning, he decreed, If it is a son, if it is a male, a boy, you are to kill him. And after, later, he decreed, Every son that will be born into the river, you shall throw him. And ultimately, Af al Amo Gazar, he applied this decree even to his own people as well, so that they throw their babies in as well. This is a crazy guy. What would he do this for, right? Here's the thing because his astrologers told him that a baby boy is going to be born who's going to be the Moshiach Shal Yisrael. He's going to be the Redeemer of Israel. And he's like, what do I do? King Nimrod failed at this as well with Abraham. I'm not going to fail. You know how I'm not going to fail? I'm going to kill not only the Jewish baby boys. I'm going to kill all the baby boys, also the Egyptians. For what? To run away from God. To such an extent people are willing to go to turn their back against the Almighty. Not realizing Hashem Malach, Hashem Melech, Hashem Yimloch, Lo Lamvad, Hashem was the king, Hashem is the king, Hashem will be the king, creator of heaven and earth forever and ever. Hashem, you can't run away from him. And if Hashem makes a decree, even a Pharaoh cannot change that decree. Even a Pharaoh can't rebel against the will of the Almighty. That's how strong. That's how powerful. We have to remember, when Hashem makes a promise, He's going to keep His promise. Hashem says, I'm going to let my people go, and I'm going to create miracles so that, it's, it's an incredible term, that we see this in the verse in the Torah, this week's, last week's parsha, this week's parsha, the parsha in parsha Shmos as well. Why did God do all these miracles? so that you and I, every one of us, can believe in Hashem. So that 3,300 years later, you'll look at the history books and they'll all say, yeah, indeed, there was a time in Egypt where all the water tor- turned into blood and all the, the, the entire country was overtaken by frogs and lice and wild animals and all the animals died. And read these history books, they'll all tell you the same exact thing. But you know what's amazing? Is that they were all predicted in advance. They were all prophesied in advance by Moshe. Where Moshe says, this is what's going to happen. And they know what's going to happen. No, but they're they're trying to push it aside. They're trying to push God aside. God, God, I'm going to be able to take over and, and do something different. But the real question is, how is that different than any one of us? Why don't we realize that sometimes we're that Pharaoh where God tells us, do the right thing and I will support you. I will give you, I'll give you the money. It says about Shabbos. What does it say about Shabbos? Levu alive on Borrow on me and I will pay back. You know what we should have for Shabbos? Every single meal we have on Shabbos should be a tomahawk steak. It should be your favorite foods. You know why? 
Oh, Rabbi, I can't afford that. What does Hashem promise in his Torah? You can't afford it? No problem. Borrow on me. I'll pay it. I'll pay it. Is that any less real than God's prediction or God's telling Pharaoh that this and this is going to happen? It's not any different. So maybe perhaps by not believing every word God says, are we a little, do we have maybe a little Pharaoh in us, a little rebellious streak in us where we're not allowing Hashem to be the leader of the world? to be our God, our master. That's what we need to learn from the midwives. They said we don't care. This is the word of Hashem, and that's what we do. That's what we do. Why? Because that's the word of Hashem. Oh, but it's unpopular. You know, know, what are people going to say? People are always going to say, People are always, you know what? Anybody here who's been on any level of leadership knows. You've been on a board, at a a synagogue. I wish you well. If If you've been a president of a board, of a synagogue, I wish you more well. You get bullets from every side. What's the big deal? All I'm trying to do is help. I'm volunteering my time. I'm volunteering my resources. And I get shot from all over because that's the way it is. So what do you care what people say? People are going to say, even if you give every penny you earn to charity, you're a very wealthy person and you give everything to charity. There are people going to be criticizing, why did you give to that? Why did you give to that? Hello. (laughs) I'm the one giving and you're complaining. Yeah, you should have given to this. Everyone has advice. No one's going to be happy with everything you do. You might as well be, you know, invested in the one who will be happy with everything you do. And that is the almighty creator of heaven and earth. Hashem should bless us all to push away all of the etzahara, to push away all of that evil inclination, to push away all of the naysayers. And we should know that Hashem is there waiting for us, saying, come, come home to me. And following the word of Hashem, we will never, ever regret it. I want to share with you just one more quick story to illustrate this. There was a man who was about to close a very big business deal. And it was in the weeks between Passover and Shavuot. And during those weeks, one of the laws, because it's a time of mourning with the 24,000 students, Rabbi Akiva perished during those days. So we have a special conduct. We don't play music, live music, and we don't have we don't get get any haircuts during that time. So this individual comes to Rabbi Moshe Feinstein of blessed memory and he says to him, I want to know if I can get a I guess a a, a reprieve from this law because I'm about to close a very big business deal. And I want to come looking like a mensch, not having a straggly beard, a little bit, you know, overgrown shave. You know, it's a couple of weeks if it's possible that I can just shave so that I can look like a mensch for the business meeting. So Moshe says, don't do it. The law tells you not to do it. The Torah tells you not to do it. Don't do it. So he leaves. He says... <laughs> What does Rabbi Moshe Feinstein know about business deals? He doesn't know. He doesn't know that the people I'm meeting are non-Jews. They won't understand. Why do I look like this? I look like a, you know, come like a mensch. Clean yourself up. So he left Rabbi Feinstein's house. He goes home and he shaves. And he comes to the business meeting all clean cut during this time that we're not supposed to shave. And, you know, they're about to close the deal. They're ready to sign the documents. And the guy says, but wait, wait, what? just one more second. He says, how do I know that I can trust you? How do I know that I can trust you? He says, me, I'm an Orthodox Jew. I keep Shabbos. I follow the laws of God. He says, you're an Orthodox Jew? He says, I, I know that the Orthodox Jews during this period of time don't shave. Because I know from other, other people I've done business with, 
that this is a time that you guys don't shave. Why are you shaving? He says, well, I, 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 <laughs> he starts giving a humming and hawing. He says, if you're not reliable to your God, you're not trustworthy to your own God, to your own commandments, you're not trustworthy to me, I'm out. We have to not shy away. We have to not shy away. When we know that there's the right thing to do, do it and do it with pride. Have an amazing Shabbos.